Welcome back to Up The Villa podcast. This is the debrief where I take a deeper dive in Wolves 1, Aston Villa 1. We take a look at the average positions. We take a look at the passing networks. We have a look at the stats from the game. We go back to the tactical pad um, and have a look at how we felt like the shape of the team was. We've got still images of what happened in that game as well. So it's a real deep dive uh, and having an understanding of, of what actually happened in the games. My favourite episode of the week. Absolutely love doing this show. So stay tuned for all of that. If you are new, subscribe. Comment your thoughts in the comment section down below. It goes off like a fan forum every single time. So it's your chance to get involved as well. And just drop a like on this episode as well. But look what I've got on. Some cheeky, cheeky, vintage, retro, Villa 90s. Training gear, absolutely love this one. It's an absolute beauty. The, the fabric on it is just lovely. It's a great fit. It's a great jumper. Uh, absolutely love it. So um, sporting some new retro Villa at the minute as well. So let's get into it then. Wolves 1, Villa 1. Um, and I really want to just have a little chat with you at the start about where Villa are and the direction in which we're going in. Because for me, it's absolutely fantastic. It's an absolute remarkable start to the season for many different reasons. But it is a fantastic start if you are an Aston Villa fan watching this. I know some Wolves fans might be watching it, but, you know, that gap's just going to get... Bigger and bigger, unfortunately. So you've had your day out at the Molyneux. And uh, there we go. So let's get back to Villa then. So Villa, the perspective of where we are is absolutely amazing. You know, we're sitting in fifth place. We're a point behind Liverpool. We are two points behind Man City. Four points off the top spot. And it's just, it's just brilliant. Like, I don't think any Villa fan would have expected us to be sort of fifth place, a couple of points behind Man City, etc. I think we all expected us to be in and around sixth place, knocking around there. But it's been a great start. And I think it's it's got to be spoke about because of what's happened at the start of this season as well. And with the injuries to key players, to... Be where we are, missing Mings, Buendia, Ramsey, Carlos has missed games. It's just been absolutely fantastic. So the, the lads have done so well to be in this position right now. And I think we're only going to get better as well as the season goes on. We are, we are going to get better and better and better when some players come back. And we just evolve as a team. So I think, you know, we, we need to give ourselves a bit of credit of where we are and, and what we're doing because we're doing really well. And I think, you know, we can look at the Wolves game and think, you know, really we would have liked three points, like an extra two points would have had us comfortably in the top four. But I think what we can take from the game against Wolves especially is the manner in which we are playing football, the manner in which we are going about playing football. And it feels to me like we're not sitting in fifth based on pure luck. It's not one of those where a team's just had a really good start and there's going to be this massive drop-off, which you can see happen sometimes with certain teams. Um, so I think what my general point is, we, we are evolving con consistently all of the time and Unai is really pushing the players to be better and to adapt to different scenarios against Wolves we went with the same the same formation it's generally the same formation with different personnel but the different personnel alters the way in which that system looks and game on game we're seeing depending on the opposition, we're seeing different tweaks to the way we play football. And I think that, to me, is a sign of a really, really good team. The the way in which we go into games looking to completely impose our style, we look to keep all of the ball, we want possession, we want to dictate the pace of the game. So using 
yesterday as an example. We really go to have a look at the tactical pattern. And one of the, the main things that really impressed me, the, the way we set up. So generically, we tend to go heavy on one side. So we'll go heavy on the left-hand side. We will normally generally go with Matty Cash in that area. So Cash would be there and he would offer a bit of threat going there. But ultimately, his role is to be in a three to sit where Conta is currently sitting. Yesterday against Wolves, we tweaked our system in the same formation, but we went with three centre-halves. Now, those three centre-halves look to spread out even further and give us more defensive structure and fan the width of the pitch, basically, which in essence allows Cash to go forward, which Cash plays in front of the double pivot, but it also enables Luca Dean to go forward as well and really make up at times a five across the middle as well. So when you've sort of got Luca Dean, Louise, Kamara, Cash, and McGinn drifting in that area or DRB, it then can become a five across the middle. So the adaptation in the way that we played against Wolves was a little bit more commanding to enable us to look more structured defensively. And I think what happened in this game when we had possession and when you can imagine where we were here and we were just dwelling on the ball and we were waiting and we were waiting for Wolves to engage and there would become times where they didn't really want to engage. They really wanted to sit with that sort of mid block and we would just go left to right to command our shape. To me, that is a, a team in control, in complete control of the game. And that was one of the most pleasing aspects. We can't force the opposition team to come and press us. If they want to sit in that block, then that's up to them. Yes, this did mean that we became stifled somewhat in the way in which it would go out wide and there was a lack of space and we, we really sort of lost the ball numerous times. But to me, this is a testament to the way in which we want to go forward and we want to play football. I would say we're not the finished article in this. So, OK, we could have maybe some critics saying it might be too slow, it might be this, it might be that. But we are by no means the finished article. Nobody, I hope, as a Villa fan, is thinking that this is the be all and end all. This is the best it gets. Because for me, in a year's time, we're going to have a bigger philosophy. We're going to probably have different players once Unai's, you know, manifested his complete team. But for me, one of the biggest positives is that Aston Villa are going about their business and trying to impose ourselves and our style on the game. Yes, styles make matches, so at times it's difficult to, to break through teams. We saw that with, you know, a golfing clash. You know, Wolves are probably a better side than Zurinsky most are, but it's still difficult to break these teams down. And credit probably does need to go to Wolves in the way in which they were tenacious in the tackle. They were defending well. But my other point in contrast is Wolves played the exact same way in which they played against Man City. They don't change. They can't change. They're not, they haven't got a tactical astute manager like Unai Emery to change personnel and play different systems like what we do. So I think for me, that's a big point. Like this Wolves team beat Man City. So they are dangerous and they are lethal at the Molyneux. So I think I'm just really pleased in the, in the way in which that when we watch Villa, it's not the same every week. We tweak, we change, we do different things. Sometimes we, we, we won't play our best, but we've got to take into consideration sometimes what has just happened. We've played in Poland. We played Chelsea. We've played in the Cup. We've then played Brighton. We've played in Europe. We've then played Wolves. That's a lot for this team who aren't used to doing it. And we are slowly getting there because we're playing in Europe and we're not losing games straight after. So to me, already, we've adapted well in the Premier League to 
this challenge what we've had. When I was on the overlap, Jamie Carragher was like, yeah, but I see it being really difficult for Villa because you're in Europe, you're not used to it, you've got the Premier League. Well, most games after we've played in Europe, we haven't lost. So for me, that's a real positive. And we're missing key players as well. You know, the bench looked really good against Wolves, actually. So, you know, that was a big positive as well. We've got players coming off the bench that are changing the game as well. Zaniolo, when he came on, looked really good. So I think where I'm trying to get at is we're in a very, very good position. We're not going to win every week. We're not that team yet. We're far from the finished article. So... For where we are right now, with everything that's been going on, the adaptation to Europe, the amount of injuries, to go into this international break in fifth place is absolutely fantastic. And I'm, and I'm just so happy with, with, with where we are and what we're doing. So, um, so let's get in there then and let's have a look at the tail of the game. Um, and then we'll have a look at some of the images from the game as well. So... Here we go. Aston Villa are in fifth place. We've played eight games. We're on 16 points. I know a lot of you like to look at the 10-game mark and, and assess where we are and you can get an understanding of where you can be this season when you get to that 10-game mark. So I'm looking at 20 points. If we can get 20 points after 10 games, we are in business. So really, really good. So the momentum bar from the game, Aston Villa are at the bottom in the blue. Wolves are at the top in the green. Um, I wouldn't have thought in that second half towards the end of the game, they would be so heavy in that area there. But there's the tail of the game. Villa had some big spells. If we have a look at some of the stats, I think Gary O'Neill might want to have a look at some of the stats because... He was sort of saying that Villa weren't that progressive. We were quite defensive. We lacked um, a threat going forward. Okay, so we've had 18 shots to eight. We've had four on target to three. We've had 54% possession. Uh, we have had 10 corners to their two. We've had 19 free kicks to their eight. Big chances for both was three. Big chances missed for both was two. And we they would work once. The XG uh, by the minute you can see here, Villa with a 1.77, Wolves with a 1.91. Uh, the XG shot map, you can see Aston Villa are in the blue, absolutely peppering that goal at times. Uh, and then you've got the passes. We've had 393 passive, 84% passing accuracy. And they had... Um, they had... 79% passing accuracy with 357 passes. Uh, and we had a dribble success of zero, which isn't too great. And they had a dribble success of 60. This is how both of the teams lined up then. So they went unchanged from the game against Manchester City. And you can see there from their average positions that only three players were above the halfway line and you can pretty much see that like I said in the match preview before the game that they have a front three and then everybody else is sort of in in behind the front three so the three is the focal point um, and this is how they attacked with their passing network Dawson, Kilman and Gomez was the, the range that was passed to the most they had decent threat with um, Huang and Neto and then Cunha was dropping off a little bit deeper um, and not really offering too much of a threat going forward. But it was out wide where they looked to cause the problems with Huang and Neto. Aston Villa made a change. We had Diego Carlos coming in for Zaniolo. And other than that, it was pretty much unchanged from Aston Villa. So we really went for a heavy three across the back line. Matty Cash going into... Um, midfield actively acting as a right winger and then this was Aston Villa's average position so you can see Pau 14, Carlos 3 and Consat number 4 with that sort of back 3 and then you've got Cash out wide, you've got Luca Dean in a high position and then you've got the midfielders of McGinn, 
46, Louise 44 of Kamara. But there just wasn't that flow uh, with the midfield. I didn't think we really connected that well in midfield. And I think that was partly down to the breakdown and why we just weren't as attacking as what we normally are and, and as free-flowing as we normally are. And you can kind of see this from Aston Villa's passing network. There's a great network between Carlos and Torres and Luca Dean. And then as you shift towards that left-hand side of Louise McGinn and Watkins, that's okay. That That's quite nice on that side. But as you go to that right-hand side where Diaby and Cash are, Kamara, there's a real lack of passes. There's a real lack of combinations. And you could really tell that it just wasn't really happening for DRB and Cash in that game. And I think you can really gauge what was happening, especially on that right-hand side. Um, it wasn't as good as what we saw probably in a game like we played against Burnley. But the defensive shape was good. Um, and, I, and I think we, we, we actually... We actually played okay. I don't think it was as bad as what um, I don't think it was as bad as what I thought it was straight after the game. I think on reflection, I, I think we we played okay, um, but you know it just wasn't as good as what we have played. And I think that's probably where Villa fans have got a little bit of frustration. Is that you could tell that we were below below our, our level, and I think. You know, that's the side, you know, we can all see now how we play and how Emery sets us up. But if something isn't quite working, we can really kind of, we can really kind of see what's not working. And for me, it was the Diaby cash combination. It was that it was the lack of threat to sort of like Diaby and Watkins. Um, and it was just like there was a lack of space. And I think it was how Wolves were defending um, that we kind of just, we needed a bit of a dribbler in there as well. And I think we'd, you know, we, we we lack Ramsey in those times. So you can see danger creation for Villa, quite central, a little bit out wide on that left and right hand side as well. Uh, I just wanted to pick up on two players' performances, and it was at Diego Carlos. I thought Carlos had a really good game. You can see with his 91% passing accuracy, um, you know, he, he had a real solid, strong game, and I think. You know, it's nice to see him come in and look and look completely solid. So, yeah, it was great to see Carlos, a player that I felt didn't have a great game, but so for score gave him 7.1, was Dougie Luiz with 81% passing accuracy. Uh, he had uh, five of his seven ground duels won. But I just don't think he was at his normal level for some reason. And, and, that, and that's just my eye test of watching... Louise, I, I think he's played a lot of games recently. He could do with a break. He looked like he got a bit rattled when he had his hands on someone's throat. And he had a big chance as well, to be fair. That cutback he had, and I, I felt like, you know, that could have gone in. Um, you know, it was, it was a big chance. But, you know, shout out to Ollie Watkins. His last three games, he's scored against Chelsea, three against Brighton, and assist against Wolves. So that's from Statman Dave. So, yeah, re real solid numbers from, from Ollie Watkins, which is, which is great to see. Um, so, if we have a look now at the slides then of the game, uh, what happened? Uh, this was an absolute rocket from John McGinn. I thought this was in. I thought this was in. It was an absolute rocket. But before that, we'd had uh, Cash's shot at the... Uh, at the um, Overload on the far post, which, which you know, was a great save from Saar. We'd had Powers glancing header. So we started the game really, really well, you know. And I think if I look back on this game, I think I look back to the goal that Wolf scored and the chance for Neto. And then I start thinking about the chances that Villa had. Cash twice at the back post. Pau Torres' is glancing header that he missed. Dougie Louise being teed up at the edge of the box. This McGinn chance. We'd got um, the Watkins header, the Zaniolo shot. So even though we were below par for a Villa side, we still created so many chances. We still created guilt edge chances. And even though we were below par, we, we still could have gone on to win the game. And I think that also 
shows where we are as a team that we, we played not that great. Emery said it himself, but the chances are still there to go on and win the game. So um, I think that's, you know, massive, really. So, um, yeah, McGinn's shot here uh, was a big one that I thought was going in. Um, the next one here now uh, is something that I liked from Pau Torres, and I, and I really do like it. This is when we started the second half. And we just look like we'd got more impetus about us with that with that back three. You know, you've got Zanio. I think this must be like Zaniolo here. You've got Luca Dean out on this far side. And this is one of our three centre halves now driving forward, picking the ball up, and just pushing the team forward. And 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 this was a, it was a great sight to see. You've got Dougie sitting a little bit deeper. Kamara. Uh, going into this zone as well. So I think this is good to see from Pau Torres. Now, this is something that I want to talk about. And this is what I mean about like Dougie's performance. We have the ball here and we were looking quite good at the start of the second half. Now, Dougie dwells on the ball here and gets dispossessed, which is the first area that I think is the problem with this goal because we were getting into like good areas in this game and we were kind of just doing ourselves no favour at times by just losing the ball in random areas that we shouldn't really be losing it and then you can see here now the ball gets switched to the opposite side so if I look at this screen grab here now we actually look like we're in a good shape because we've got defensive protection here. We've got our back. We've got our back three. We've got Huang next to Konsa. So Konsa's in front of his man. And we've got one, two, three players, four, because this player here is technically out of the game because he's on the floor. So we've got four, four, we've got seven players that are retreating against two. So I think if you look at Pau now, he's got kind of got a decision to make. Does he go and fully engage with Neto and technically take a risk? Because if he gets done, then Neto is away. So Neto would be away. If Pau engages and gets done, Neto is away and it's a 2v3. So that would be a problem. But what we find is that if I show you now, this is now Neto on the ball. So Neto's on the ball. I'd probably say that's about 35, 40 yards out. Is that about 35, 40 yards out from goal? We should not be allowing, because we've got cover, because Luca Dean's now actively as cover. He needs to engage for me. At the start of the move, if we engaged here, it's a risk because there's no support. You've only got Carlos that can support you there. So if Neto gets past Pau, Carlos is the only cover going into there. It's a risk. But here, it isn't a risk. I think he has to go and engage, but he doesn't. He's in retreat mode. And we are in retreat mode until Neto gets to the byline. So if we go back to where he picked the ball up, so he's picked the ball up in that area there, and he's now being allowed to get to this area to get past Pau Torres and put the ball in the box. So I really think Pau needs to just decision make and commit. Find the right moment to commit because we've seen this goal about three times now this season. And I think he needs to just commit to taking that player, take the tackle, take him down, just do something to stop that player getting into that area. We've then got Huang who gets in between uh, Louise and Carlos. And it's a, it's a good finish from Huang. But... 
that should have been dealt with for me far earlier than when it got to that that point, to be honest. And then we have now some brilliant play and Pau sort of like, like covers for the mistake because he's at the back post and he and he seals it and he and he, it's a great finish. So he kind of makes up for it, which I think, you know, he is really, really good. But there was another occasion where Neto had a run on Pau again. And he sort of cut inside in front of Pau. So uh, I know Neto is a fantastic player, but I just think Pau's just got to sometimes just decision make and, and make that tackle. And then here's the screen grab of, of, of Watkins eating the post towards, you know, the end of the game. Um, you know, she probably should have scored. Uh, but, you know, there was a lot of different other talking points. We had all those chances. I still stick by. I think it was a penalty. Um, I think if that's anywhere on the pitch outside the box and the player's about to cross it or shoot and the player's being pushed in the back, it's a penalty. Um, so I think that was a, a bad decision. I don't think the Kamara won on Neto was a penalty. I think he just stepped in front of him. He got across uh, and he was just, he was just stronger. Um, so yeah, I think it was, in the end, I think we had enough chances to win the game. I think we probably should have edged it with the clear-cut chances that we did have. We had more clear-cut chances than they had. Um, so, yeah, and I think, again, we weren't at our best, but we was able to get a point away from home and get our first draw. And I think, you know, that... that we don't want to be that team that either wins or loses at times. Sometimes the draw keeps it ticking over, doesn't it? Keeps momentum, keeps momentum going. Those little points where we usually throw things away or or do stuff like that can be really frustrating, can't it? So difficult game, derby didn't come out on you know losing it. Um, just rest now. Some players just rest. Uh, I know a lot of them are going on international duty, but the RB looks a little bit off it. Rest up. Louise, rest up. The defenders, Consa, Carlos, Power's been called up. So, you know, some of them have been called up, but just we need we need a bit of a bit of a rest now. A, a, a week where we don't play two games in a week. And we can come back and we've got some good fixtures to look at. And I think we've got West Ham. Luton, Forest, uh, but, you know, just one game at a time. Just let's focus on West Ham. That'll be a tough game. Uh, but all in all, I, I can't explain how happy I am to be a Villa fan. Um, I think we're doing really well. Far, 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 far from the finished article. Um, so I think we're going to get better and we're going to adapt and we, we're still growing under Unai Emery. We're still finding our feet. We are still tactically adjusting how he wants us to do things. So yeah, we're in, we're in a really, really good, solid, strong place. Um, so yeah, buzzing, absolutely buzzing. Hopefully you've enjoyed the debrief. Uh, quite a bit of content coming out this week, coming up to be fair. Uh, we are going to be doing a special episode with Hannah. Uh, so that will be out this week. We have a special guest coming on this week as well. We have got two England watch-alongs. So we are going to be doing watch-alongs for England. We're going to be on Ollie Watkins' watch. So we can watch the game together, have a chat, chat about the Villa, uh, chat about England, chat probably about how crap Southgate is. Um, and then, yeah, and so we've got quite a lot coming up, to be fair. So it should be a good little week worth of content for you all as well. Um, if you are new, subscribe to the channel. Just get involved and, yeah, speak to you all soon. Up the villa. Mind the gap. Mind the gap. Wolverhampton. <laughs>